Once you have the Boltzmann transport equation, we can make a few more approximations and arrive at something that we're actually going to be able to use to do simple but useful predictions of photon distributions in tissue. And that's to get to the diffusion equation for photon transport. There are a lot of approximations that get used in order to get there, and this tutorial is to give you a sense of what those approximations are. You'll recall from the Boltzmann transport equation video that we are talking about this energy density distribution, little lowercase u, which specifies the directions that light is heading at a given location in the tissue are in a particular direction, omega hat, that would be one of the particular arrows that you see here. And this whole distribution can be changing as a function of time as well. The Boltzmann transport equation doesn't make any assumptions about what this distribution is, but when moving to the diffusion equation, we will make some approximations that are appropriate when we're working in highly turbid tissue. So we're going to say that this distribution is approximately equal to an isotropic term. So for that, I'll draw that same dot that I have in the middle of that polar plot, but I will just draw a circle around it, circle of radius A, and I'll say that there's this isotropic term here, which is a scalar value A, and it's a function of position in the tissue, but it's not a function of direction. So we have an isotropic term like this, and then this distribution isn't really isotropic at all, so we need to add at least a little bit of anisotropy to this. So we're going to add to it a vector term. Now in here, the, the bias in this distribution is most strongly straight out to the right, so I'm going to draw a little arrow here straight out to the right. I'm going to label it vector B. And then the term that we will add here is a cosine dependence of any particular direction that we might want to study. And we're going to say that that extra term is B, sort of the overall strongest direction of photon flow dot it into the direction vector. So if I add these two terms together, I get a weakly anisotropic distribution. If I were to sketch that in, I might say that if as a reference point, I have isotropic u, equal arrows going in all directions, and then if I draw in solid blue, that's roughly the distance a plus vector magnitude b in this direction. In the backward direction, it would be a minus b, because I have this cosine dependence. So in the backward direction, cosine is minus 1. And the distribution as a whole might look something like this. So it's anisotropic, but only with a cosine dependence now. So that's one approximation that we've made. The second approximation is that the photon transport looks something like this. I'm not going to draw the path crossing itself, just for clarity's sake. The argument is that by the time the photon gets absorbed, which I'll mark with this red dot here, that there are many scattering events that happen prior to the photon getting absorbed. And we're going to make the approximation of reduced scattering. So the argument that we're making here is that these reduced scatterings are much more frequent than absorption events. Another way you could write that is mu a divided by mu s prime is much, much less than 1. Or you could say that the albedo, that's a term that comes up in the book, the albedo, which is the ratio of scattering interactions to or reduced scattering interactions to total interactions, is approximately 1. And I guess that would be the reduced albedo given here. So that's the second approximation that we make, that most photons will scatter many times before they absorb. That's a reasonable approximation if we're trying to study photon transport in turbid tissue, because these things do indeed take many different steps before they tend to get absorbed. The next approximation is 
a little less obvious. In the previous video, video, I mentioned that we didn't say a lot about where the sources of scattered light come from. Let's focus on that. In a typical application, we're going to have something that we would call the primary beam. This might be the light coming out of an optical fiber placed against the surface of your skin. So I label that the primary beam. That beam is very, very anisotropic. All the photons are heading in one direction. As that light enters into the tissue, it will encounter scatterers. And when we talk about a source of diffuse light that's being kept track of in the Boltzmann transport equation, we're talking about light that's what you might call first scattered light. Light that was in the primary beam and now goes into this secondary beam. It's this secondary light that we're actually keeping track of in the Boltzmann transport equation and also what we're keeping track of in the diffusion equation. There is light in the tissue that hasn't scattered yet. Once it scatters, it then becomes part of what we do our bookkeeping with, with either the Boltzmann or the diffusion equation. The approximation we make here is that the secondary scattering, this light depleted from the primary beam and entering into the diffuse distribution, that that's isotropic. So if you look back at the previous video for where we were putting in source terms for how light could join distribution U, the argument here is that those sources of new light for the, for the U distribution are generated isotropically. So this happens rather than having a highly forward peaked scattering distribution. And that is related, of course, to our reduced scattering approximation, where we replace the true highly forward scattering events with a smaller amount of isotropic scattering events. The third term is somewhat challenging for me to explain, but I will do my best. It has to do with the rate of change of the energy distribution. So let me make a little time plot here, and I'm going to talk about du dt. Now I wrote a capital U there, so it's probably time for me to talk about what capital U is. So capital U is an integral of little u. If I sum up all of these photons and count them all in a scalar sense, the total amount of joules, the energy per unit volume, is what I will get if I sum up little u over all directions. So I'm simply counting <clears throat> how much energy there is per unit volume heading in this direction and in this direction and this direction. I integrate that over all solid angle, so over 4 pi solid angle. And that gives me a quantity, instead of being joules per unit volume and steradian, it's just joules per unit volume. So you can think of this as energy density. That's what we're going to write the diffusion equation in terms of. The statement that we're making is that if we make a time axis and we mark from a starting some time, arbitrary starting time zero, and we start our clock, here's what we would call delta T collision. This is the amount of average time between scattering events that happen in the tissue. We'll calculate that in a second. But if I watch what the rate of change of this energy density is, if I know what it is at time zero, say here, and I look at what it is at a time here later, maybe it drops by a certain amount. So if this is what it would have been if it stayed absolutely constant in time, maybe it drops by this much. So if I connect those two points with a line, the slope of the line is the second derivative d squared u dt squared. And the assertion that we're making here is that that amount of change is sort of small over the time scale of a single collision. And the way we quantitatively measure that is we can calculate a different slope here. I'll mark this one in red. And that would be that slope there. What's that slope? That's simply the rise over run. Am the amplitude of that slope is du dt divided by delta t 
of a collision. So I'll put absolute values around these. We're not trying to refer to whether they're positive or negative. So you can see from this diagram that the the slope of the second derivative of u with respect to t is much less than in amplitude than the slope du dt divided by delta t of collision. So the mathematical thing that the book will explain in more detail that we need to assert is that the second derivatives of capital U with respect to T, they are much, much less than the magnitude of du dt times 1 over the times of the typical time between collisions. And the time between collisions, that's an inverse of a rate. To get the rate of collisions, we multiply the total likelihood of interactions with the speed of light. We've seen that in the previous video. We're going to define a quantity here. If we define a diffusion constant d to be cn over 3 times mu a plus mu s prime, then the delta t of collision winds up being able to be written as 3d over cn squared. So this is a mathematical relationship that it turns out that you need in order to eliminate some terms from the Boltzmann transport equation on your way to the diffusion equation. I just want you to think of this as slow changes in du dt and in the source term q. So a little mathematical, but good to have it for your notes. There's one last assertion that we have to make. We also want to say that d, d is a property of the speed of the light and the optical properties of the tissue. And we say that d has no spatial dependence, no R dependence. So it's a homogeneous, a spatially homogeneous tissue. Okay, if we do all of this asserting, we then can start with the Boltzmann transport equation and we integrate it over all solid angles, sort of as we did up here. So when you integrate u over that, you get the capital U. If we integrate all the terms in the Boltzmann transport equation, we end up getting the following. Instead of an equation for d little u dt, we get an equation for the change in big U dt. And remember that that's only a function of position and time now. There's now no directional dependence of the light. This is the total energy density, energy per unit volume. Here are the terms that emerge when we apply all of this. We have an absorption loss term that looks like this. Absorption loss. Next we have a term that the book calls S0, S0. And this is a gain term, what we'll call source gain. And remember, this isn't little light sources being implanted in the tissue like a light bulb. This is more about incident light from the primary beam. Once it scatters and joins the U distribution, its source locations are isotropic sources. So that's really what we typically mean in biomedical optics when we're applying these equations. So we've got absorption loss, source gain, and we have this diffusion term. And the diffusion term now comes out of the math of this. It ends up looking like this. And this is not obvious that it's a second derivative spatially. But this is our diffusion term. Unlike absorption, which is always a loss, and new scattering coming from the primary beam, which is always a gain, this diffusion term could be loss or gain. And it depends 
on where you are and possibly on what time it is. We'll talk about that further in class, but this term, unlike the others, isn't automatically loss or gain. It will depend on that. Now, you may be wondering what happened to scattering loss and what happened to inscatter from other diffuse photons that join the beam. You might remember that from the Boltzmann transport equation video. And the answer is that by integrating over all directions, There is no longer any losses or gains due to scattering. Any photon that scatters out of the beam heading in direction omega hat starts going in another direction omega hat prime. Any inscatter that comes into direction omega hat was lost from that incident direction omega hat prime. So scattering changes, scattering events don't affect book the bookkeeping because we're no longer keeping track with capital U of the photons that are heading in a particular direction. We're only keeping track of the total energy density at locations in space. So it's kind of neat that the scattering events cancel themselves out. So in going from Boltzmann to diffusion, we have a new term that we're keeping track of. We have a new scattering dependence. We go to the reduced scattering approximation. We make some assumptions about the ratio of scattering to absorption, about the isotropy of the way light enters the U distribution, and an approximation about the angular dependence of little u that underlies it all, and some assumptions about the rate at which things change, that they don't change too fast, and we'll define that in the future. When you do all of that, you end up with this equation in the box here. And that is the diffusion equation that we will now put to work to calculate actual photon densities and reflectances from turbid tissues that are homogeneous.